place. And so uh, very quickly, Utopia, some of you don't know, we're a uh, urban innovation group for emerging cities and their slums in Asia, Africa, Latin America. And so many times the cities that are most quickly growing uh, and oftentimes breaking a bit under the weight of that growth are the cities that don't have these urban ecosystems to pull together the different players. And so our attempt is to go in and help support the local ecosystem of entrepreneurs and government and other players that could potentially shape more positive futures for those quickly growing cities. Not looking to New York or London, definitely not San Francisco necessarily as a model and how they can develop. I think uh, Asia and Africa in particular need to find their own model of urban growth, certainly Latin America as well. And so we're there to support that. And the way that we're trying to do that is set up these city lab platforms, these urban venture studios. Uh, and right now we're active in Rio de Janeiro, we're active in Kathmandu uh, in Nepal. Uh, and we're just now active in Lagos uh, in, uh, in Nigeria as well. And La Lagos will actually be the biggest city in the world by 2100. It should be before that, but by the end of the century. Uh, any guess on how many people you think will be there? Benjamin can't answer this because I've asked this a few times before. I don't know. Oh, you, you deflate me already. Uh, 100 million is a bit too high. 70. 70? What was, I heard? 88 million people. So Lagos will have 88 million people. And I think tonight as we listen to uh, uh, the thoughts is what does a city look like when it has 88 million people? How does, is it, welcome in. Um, so I'll very quickly move over here from uh, Emro, um, who has become a dear friend of the last year or so. Uh, I have uh, been learning uh, about how you create intentional experiences for people and really appreciate you moderating tonight. Um, from Julia, I, from Facebook, I have been learning about sustainability of buildings that within five seconds also grew to a lot of questions and, and conversation about sustainability in cities. And when we talk about the future of cities, we're really talking about the future of society. And from Marcus, uh, I have been learning, uh, first of all, I've learned that there's such a thing as cyborg anthropology, which he wants to do a PhD or did want to do uh, a PhD in cyborg uh, anthropology. But he's also been teaching me about as we are creating our cities as we're building our cities, our cities are building us. Um, so I've really enjoyed getting to know uh, all three of you, and thanks so much for sharing tonight. Great. All right, um, so as Jonathan said, this is gonna be kind of a meandering, informal conversation, so at any point when this conversation um, gets heated and you have a question, feel free to kind of be part of this. This is not, this is why you're in a circle. Um, I have questions, certainly, to get us going, but um, would love to hear your, your input. Um, there's also four members in uh, the audience that have quotes, and you're going to really help me when I cue you um, to move into the next kind of topical conversation. Um, so at first, I, I kind of wanted um, Julia and Marcus to introduce themselves by um, sharing what is most valuable to them and what, um, how that influences emergent cities. Just an easy <laughs> question. Um, so uh, as mentioned, um, I'm, I'm with Facebook, I'm a global sustainability lead, and I work primarily in our built infrastructure. Um, and while I think about the product side, that's a, not a lot of what my world is. My world is actually trying to design um, our, our, our buildings and our environments around the communities that we move into. Um, the thing that I hold most valuable that I think really uh, impacts my view of cities is, is an inherent um, belief in the goodness and resilience of people um, and, and a belief that we learn best and we do our best when we interact with one another. Um, and that's not always easy to do. Um, and I think that when we've hit those diverse points, we feel that friction the most. It's also the most opportunity for growth. Um, so I think that informs a lot of my value in cities. Um, for me, you know, I'd have to say the three things are cultural uh, diversity and connectivity. Um, I think culture really is the backbone of any city. You know, it's what actually uh, shapes our values, really looks at uh, what we care about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, diversity gives us those different perspectives of how we should approach a different solution or problems that we all are going to face within the city structure. Um, and I really think that connectivity is something that shouldn't be lost. You know, uh, when we talk about cyborg anthropology, as Jonathan mentioned, you know, sometimes we can get engulfed in, you know, what technology can do for us um, and really kind of forget what that human-to-human -human connectivity actually means. So I think those three values are something that I really approach uh, in my personal life as well as uh, would like to see through cities. Awesome. 
Um, so the first quote is from the co-founder of a startup, Jonathan, help me out, Startup Africa, I believe. Future um, Africa. Future of Africa. Yes. Um, yes. Um, so if you have his card, please read it loud and proud. Okay. Feel free to stand up. Uh, so this is from, I'm not going to try to stab at his name. Uh, he goes by E. e. I did e. the same thing. <laughs> All right, sorry. Over the next half century, more than, more than other world will live in cities. One third of that growth will come from emerging cities in China, India, and Nigeria. Today, China and India seem better prepared for that rapid urbanization than many African cities are. And now, when we consider, so what was, what was uh, <coughs> kind of said there was that um, India, China, and Africa are kind of like the three hub spots for the future of mega cities. Um, and when we consider that um, 13 out of the 20 mega cities will be in Africa, and that it's currently happening now, like the migration is happening now, the infrastructure is being built now, what do you feel needs to evolve and what do you feel needs to stay um, in terms of how we build cities? Can I go first? Sure. Um, you know, with these cities actually becoming um, placed online uh, very rapidly, um, there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of things to really consider when we're talking about building cities. Uh, what do we want to leapfrog? Uh, what type of uh, new innovations do we want to take a hold of? Uh, if we look at cities, uh, particularly the ones that you mentioned, they also have the youngest populations on the planet. So they're going to look at the world totally differently than, than ancient times. Um, but then also there's an opportunity to get back to this ancient wisdom. And I speak about ancient wisdom uh, where there's this, a substantial amount of um, creativity um, as well as connectivity to nature that is already embedded in a lot of these communities. So how they solve things is really a biomimicry of what actually the city could become in the future. Um, a lot of my work was informed through running a nonprofit organization called the World Education Foundation and being on the ground with a lot of these communities, whether it be in the DR Congo or in Myanmar or in Iraq, you see that the way that they solve and the way that they approach communities um, is with a holistic lens. You know, it's not just about technology is going to solve all of my problems. Sometimes you have to go through uh, a, a, a recreation of something that has already been done. Uh, but then that also gives an opportunity to leapfrog. You know, so when we're talking about technology or connectivity or transport or sustainability or regeneration, uh, regenerative practices, all those things can be embedded into the community through these different systems that, that will be coming out. Uh, so riding a little bit off of that, um, I think what's, what's really interesting about the development of, of these cities is that there's a lot of opportunity to, to forge their own paths. Um, and to think exactly that is to think about their philosophy of space and commune differently than, than I think a lot of um, existing cities uh, have, have really um, been able to do since their development. Um, and I specifically think about that in terms of the commons. And I, I think that we have an opportunity in, in the developing, these developing nation, sort of cities that, that will become larger than anything that we're used to, um, to rethink the way that we view resources as communal elements of, of, um, their, of society, rather than owned by individuals. And I think that that's where we get to some of the, a lot of the spark earlier about co-living and, and co-generating co ourselves. So thinking about energy systems as collaborative and as, as, oh, as um, developed for the commons and generated to and from the commons. So thinking about community wind farms, for example, it's a very small example here, but, but when you think about that, it's about a bit of a different mindset. Um, I think a lot of this gets to the idea of a, a different sized city. We, we talked about uh, pedestrian friendly cities. If we can think about um, a, a high density that comes in mid rises with a lot of green space involved in them and not only high rises for high rises sake, that that's not the only way to develop high density um, and that you have a lot more access to the sun and to, to green space by developing at different scales. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to think about how to do that 
Granted, in some of these more distressed areas, it's gonna be hard to have green space and it's gonna be hard to find the water. So regenerative systems is vital when you start thinking about that and thinking about planning ahead for scarcity around water. Um, and I think that that's vitally important. Um, and I, I do think that th these are the populations that are capable of thinking anew about some of this work. And I think that that's, that's where we're gonna have real opportunity. And then the last thing is education and women. And I think we're gonna see a, a very different approach to the sort of exploitation of resource use because we are doing more uh, and more is happening around education with women and thinking about population and, and how we manage ourselves in spaces like that in, in the near to, to mid future. Marcus, did you wanna share? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. It, you look like you wanted to share something as well. You know, um, I think the, the, what I wanted to piggyback off what Julia said is just, you know, really looking at um, being informed. So cities right now are kind of this aggregate of all these different types of things, whether it be consumer goods, whether it be ideas, you know, this transference of knowledge, all these things. But then also, you know, how do you keep pace with, you know, resources that you need to support all the people that may want to be in the city. Right. And this is where informal living actually comes in and, and slums, you know, and then a lot of times when you're dealing with, a, you know, Kibera in, in Nairobi, you know, you get these settlements that are kind of on the outskirts or even on the inside of a lot of these, you know, major cities. Um, so really trying to create those uh, points of exchange where um, it's not just linear, it's not just the city actually informing these informal spaces, but really looking at what is valuable about these informal spaces. What is the, you know, how do women treat each other? You know, how do they actually keep the community together? And how do you transfer though, that knowledge from the informal spaces into the city spaces mm -hmm. as well? And um, were there any examples or projects that you worked on that kind of can serve as an example of what we can look at for evolving emergent cities? Sure, um, yeah, in 2016, um, I actually did a co-project with NYU. Um, I hired a, about three of their master students out of the School of, of, of uh, Public Affairs, and we went to Iraq and we did a project in a Syrian refugee camp um, called Domiz, um, where ultimately uh, we worked with youth 15 to 28, and we taught them how to do a needs assessment. Um, and through this needs assessment, we gave them four different verticals, uh, education, uh, agriculture, uh, health, and, and, um, and uh, security. And through that, they went out, they actually asked um, their uh, participants in, in the community, you know, what the main issues were with them. They brought that information back to the workshop and we taught them how to prototype a solution for that actual uh, problem. Um, and then, after that, they pitched it to the community. So then you have this cross-pollination of ideas. So people that may have not have got interviewed about one, they've actually have an opportunity to exchange on that one. And then they did their iterations, um, and then ultimately they came through and implemented their solutions into the community. But there was also a, a social inclusion piece to it as well. So a lot of times when we're moving uh, and we have pockets of uh, let's say the other is what a lot of people call them, the other, then a lot of the students or a lot of the locals within Kurdistan region, they didn't look at the Syrian refugees as something that could be an asset to their community. They looked at them as a burden. So with that, what we did was we hired a couple of um, PhD students from the local university and they were mentors within this program. And this was the first time that they actually worked together to come up with solutions. So, you know, through this, they were like, oh man, you're bright. Oh man, you're bright. You got these, you know, solutions that we can actually uh, piggyback on. And that changed the whole mind frame of what it was to, you know, be in that space. So it changed the dynamics of what that space meant to the host uh, community as well as the, the, uh, the migrants and the refugees that were living there. Perfect. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on. Um, so the second quote uh, is from Evan, um, if you want to read it. Uh, Evan Beckel Downey, Sunrise Climate Activist, uh, says, right now people are starting to collectively wake up to the climate crisis, corruption, and wealth inequality through memes, mass media, and political action. We are individually and collectively taking action to deal with the problems of our time because it is almost impossible to ignore them. Through the internet and collective awareness of unintended consequences, people are starting to become informed and inspired by each other globally. 
Activating local communities and individual action becomes imperative to creating effective and responsive solutions. Um, so I chose that quote because it really um, illustrates where we are right now, um, which is a, a pivotal point as we all kind of keep hearing, but it's a pivotal, it's an opportunity to be um, participants in what will the, the future will be. Um, will be the, sorry, <laughs> It's an, it's an opportunity to be insightful, to be thoughtful, to actually bring forth um, with our own efforts anything that we want to live into because all of the old infrastructure is kind of starting to, to heave a little bit. Um, so with that, there's a, there's a question of what technology, what policies, what social norms do we have now that are most promising to you? This is a, a big, big yeah. question. Um, and I, I take, Combining technology and policy, there's a lot here. Uh, I think you could probably fill a whole lecture with just this piece. Um, so I, I think systems uh, across cities is something that we could be doing a lot better with, but, but they do exist, then we have a lot to learn from them as they exist in cities today. Some cities doing a little bit better than other cities, obviously. We've seen that with the growth of some cities and the, the complete collapse of others. Um, the Urban Metabolism Lab at MIT is a really excellent source of uh, inspiration and thoughtfulness and, and lots of publications, of course, um, about thinking about those systems uh, in terms of what we're able to do now and a somewhat of a needs assessment of where do we stand as a baseline for um, either you know, thinking about how we deliver water and energy, but also thinking about how we communicate and connect with one another mm -hmm. uh, and, and thinking about uh, inherently creating more resilience around our cities and through our cities and through the people there. And I think that there, there are a lot of small things. Uh, the city of Boston does a uh, resilience and climate, uh, sort of climate change assessment mm -hmm. for major large scale developments. If they're gonna get permitted, they have to go through that process immediately mm -hmm. right off the bat. Um, they, they also require uh, a microgrid analysis for, for all major developments. And that's something that they don't, they're not forcing a private developer to do something in particular, they're forcing them to see what the cost benefits are. Mm -hmm. um, and just prompting that is, is something that is actually going a long way. Mm -hmm. um, almost every microgrid analysis then looks at renewables because uh, renewable generation is a really simple way of being able to tag into an all electric idea and really being able to trade around energy as it's used across multiple use spaces, which has also been mentioned earlier today. When you think about cities, Cities could be enhancing the 24-hourness of themselves in a way that is, is missed in a lot of cities today. Um, there's a lot of use cases for using more of our existing infrastructure much more than we do. Um, and there's a visibility that's missing on that. So I think technology gives us a possibility for visit, vi understanding how buildings are being used at any given point and being able to share them more effectively. So again, I think about the future case as being much more shared in its concepts uh, and, and how we interact with each other um, and, and being dynamic about that. And so there's a lot of value in technology that could actually give feedback about how our systems are being used uh, by people and by communities, et cetera. Um, and then the other one that's a very simple policy thing, uh, not simple, but it's, uh, it's pricing carbon. And, and I mean, I think that goes a really long way in being able to put a value on the commons that we all depend on. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think that, that the point that you made about access over ownership, I think that's really uh, something that we have to start to think like really heavily about, you know, and I mean, you can look at that as water regeneration, you know, so if we're trying to build regenerative communities, you know, in London and Singapore, they reuse their water numerous times, you know, before. Um, it actually has a, a, a output. Um, but then there's also, you know, I, I believe that tech is always going to be ahead of policy, you know, um, and that gives the opportunity to the commons, uh, you know, and to the people that are actually delivering products and solutions to get ahead of policy. And policy will catch up. Um, and there's a lot of great policies, like even here in, um, in, in San Francisco, you know, they have a compost ordinance where, you know, they pick up about 400 tons of compost, and that's actually went to up to 600 tons after there was some type of public um, understanding of how important this was. 
Um, and then there's also a construction ordinance, you know, where 75% of materials are to be reused. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you look at a lot of companies in, um, in like Amsterdam, like Sim Slim Brickers, they, they break down concrete to be reused or they have old warehouses that they trans, you know, for into co-working spaces or ideation spaces. Um, so looking at how do we really take the materials that we have and reutilize them or reuse them or repurpose them, I think it's something that policy can actually push, you know, but technology is going to be the front runner um, on how, you know, we develop those, those different solutions. Yeah, just writing off that. Uh, the being able to see what is being wasted is something that I think is an inherent problem with the built industry today, the, the built environment. I, I think we have, a, we have a, an opacity that exists when we, down to the human level, when we throw something out, something should alert us that we've just dis discarded something that's recyclable into the landfill, right? I, I, there's no feedback loop on any of that. And there are technologies that exist, there are several, that do a, a bit of more gamification around something as simple as that. Uh, going further though, uh, we don't have that visibility on the construction waste from existing spaces and having more visibility around existing good uh, materials that are coming out of spaces where someone else needs to come in and do a retrofit to a good space um, with, with good materials. And there's no visibility on that right now. We need markets that show that. And that is gonna be driven by technology without a doubt. And then the, the last one is thinking about, so we use concrete and steel a ton, and obviously those are really big um, contributors to climate change, but CLT constructed laminate timber is something that is quickly developing as a really excellent source of, and a totally regenerative material. Sure. And thinking about using that more, it's way ahead of codes. Sure. So building, there are building codes across the United States that just you can't build above four stories if you're using wood. Um, that's not nearly the fire hazard that, that the code thinks it is. Um, so it's, it's things like that where, again, I think leapfrogging and, and sort of partnering to push policy to be able to push everybody else is, is totally right. Sure. Sure. And balancing that a bit with the, um, the technology isn't everything. It's a tool that could be used. Um, when we were um, kind of talking in the back, we were talking a little bit about passive design and how um, that's, that's a, a technology, if you will, but it's very much a technique that doesn't really require technology. It just uh, requires you to know um, how to build. Um, so, um, okay, questions? Yeah. I have a question. So, um, you both talked a bit about technology uh, sort of leading policy. I'm curious if there are any places where that doesn't apply, where you see a need for like, policy leadership to provide some sort of direction go back to the one I just used. Uh, I'll think of a better one, but I think pricing carbon has not worked by putting the onus on like voluntary systems or the private industry. That just hasn't worked. And that, I would say that's that's the first one I think of. I'm trying to come up with a better one. Yeah. No, I mean, even like, you know, I've lived in Norway for quite a big uh, time. I'm back here in California now, but uh, refrigeration, you know, that's huge, you yeah. know, and uh, that's something that the Scandics are really taking a look at, you know, how do we actually have efficient refrigeration? I mean, I think that's something that's overlooked of how do we keep things cold? How do we, that's very, very energy intensive. And they have policies that are saying, you know, we want to actually get that down to a zero uh, net, you know, carbon neutral uh, type of, uh, of, of, of industry, you know, before, you know, 2030. Um, so there are policies that are out there that are working, you know, to kind of catch up or to push the technology into into that uh, that space. I mean, even if you just think about the civil, the civics, the civil scale of a lot of the a lot of what we need for um, infrastructure, I, I'm not sure that technology will rule the day before that before we think about um, helping multi, sort of multiple people from different. Uh, demands and, and different requirements. Um, so you think about, you know, I don't want, I wouldn't suggest that, this is a smaller example, but one developer should be, be should be able to, and it's not really taking the onus out of them, to be able to think about all of his neighbors and how they might benefit from him putting in a cogeneration plan. That's unrealistic. But if the policy indicated that 
for every some size of a certain block and they thought about it conceptually from a planning perspective, that is, is something that is influenced significantly by planning ahead, which requires local government. I'm not suggesting it requires necessarily federal government or, or some massive body, but it does require a local lens to, a, to more of a global community scale. And just, I mean, one more thing, uh, I was looking at my notes, but, um, you know, there's a, a project, you know, in Wallasey uh, Island, uh, actually in London, that they took uh, soil, you know, for a cross rail, and they actually put that back into Wallasey Island, which is now a regenerative biodiverse space, um, you know, that was pushed by policy. You know, I don't think they would have done it without that policy push, but that is something that uh, showcases that policy can push um, uh, regenerative uh, outputs. on um, disaster relief and what Sid was talking about with climate refugees, if there was anything that came from that that you feel like policy could support? Um, or technology? Yeah, so I, I work at a tech firm that um, we, we build products for um, helping plan for natural disasters. So I, I definitely think something that um, policy could help out with is actually um, sharing of data. Mm. Um, there's a lot of rules with the private sector on what data that they are willing to share and what they, um, obviously they, they have their reasons for keeping that private as well, but perhaps in a disaster scenario, we could have some sort of framework where um, mm. some of this data sharing between public and private um, is sort of enforced. Mm. That's something that we struggle with a lot as, um, as a tech company. Like we, we need more data, but yeah. not all that data is obviously um, for grabs. So that's, I know Massachusetts actually I think it was the Department of Energy. Um, they were sort of trying to think of ways in which they could pass some legislation where um, utility companies would be forced to um, sort of hand over their data um, during emergency situations. So I'm, I'm not quite sure where they landed with that, but I thought that was an interesting um, like idea. Yeah, I, I think there's there's so much potential um, with all of the emerging technology that's coming, but also all of the, uh, what feels like a collective action and awareness. Um, and so pairing those two things, um, it means more, more interesting jobs for refugees. Um, way more, excuse me, I'm sick. <laughs> <coughs> it means way more um, innovation that doesn't fit policy, that kind of policy has to catch up to um, in order for us to evolve. Um, and kind of start naming the things that we want to see uh, coming, or the things that are working, that maybe aren't, aren't cool yet or don't have a name for it yet. Um, okay, so I actually, I really wanted to talk about um, kind of sustainability, but more specifically, like when, the moment that either one of you or both of you um, realized that we were in a climate and ecological crisis. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember it quite vividly. Um, it was 2005, you know, when Katrina hit. Like, that just really hit home. Um, you know, at that time I was playing football. I was actually uh, playing for the Denver Broncos at that time. And I remember being in my hotel room at that time, and I just really thought that America was going to change forever. Um, and then you kind of see the 
uh, fallout of that and you know just not being able to have supplies readily available or even just having some type of climate resiliency plan set around that that really like struck home for me um, and I think that informed a lot of the work that I do now with starting up Urban Matrix One, you know, where we utilize satellite imagery, machine learning, and uh, unique data sets to quantify, you know, the sustainability of the built environment. Um, and I think, you know, it goes back to Didi's point, it's like, you know, cities have to be prepared. You know, it's like it's no longer that we have to, you know, think, oh, what if climate change is happening? You know, it's, it's not about a what if anymore. It's about how do we prepare for natural disasters? Um, so human life, you know, human resources aren't, aren't just kind of um, taking uh, a back seat to, you know, the, the capital markets, yeah. per se. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of when it really hit home for me. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of cities that are actually being proactive in doing climate <coughs> resiliency, like Washington, D.C. You know, they partnered with Perkins and Will, and they went through a, a really rigorous um, you know, climate resiliency plan. You know, there's a couple of uh, s states in the Midwest that are doing the same thing when it comes to tornadoes, you know, and where you're from, you know, Miami, I mean, you guys know that this is real. Like, it's very tangible for you, for you guys, but yeah. it's still not and enough yeah. to push, push the, these things forward. So I don't know where, you know, the pin drops, you know, to where people start to understand that this is necessary, but it's no longer about having, you know, you have to be prepared. It's right. no longer about what ifs. Right. And yet, what you were saying is, and yet, Miami continues to build giant high rises on Biscayne Boulevard. Real it's, estate is booming. It, it's Real it's estate amazing. Is booming. And, and, and it's insane. going to be a massive, yeah. massive debilitating problem when the next storm truly hits. Yeah. And, and that is something that I, despite Miami having a, a good, the Plan 21, um, where they did put into place some resiliency measures, which means raising up our electrical equipment, going to the second floor, that sort of thing, like making sure that you're out of the flood zone mm -hmm. for your dynamic equipment. Yeah. That doesn't k take the people out of your high rise when your foundation shakes. And right. like, I, I don't, I'm just not sure that, that some of that has hit home, but it's definitely true that climate resiliency plans are a real thing. Um, we're now doing them for every facility we have around the world, including well beyond our own facility, but out to the community. Mm. Um, it's beginning to be part of how we select a site to be in. Mm. We've, we're looking at the long range plan and looking at uh, climate change as a security risk mm. um, and thinking about how much more it would, expensive it would be to secure a site that is uh, in the threat or in the direct face of climate change. Yeah. Um, my not as large scale um, realization around climate, the climate crisis was like a bit different. I was not playing for the Denver Broncos to be. <laughs> um, That's what I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, in, in, uh, in fifth grade, uh, I, my, my dad challenged me to create a, um, a science fair project that proved the existence of climate change. Mm. And I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> Turns out it was really hard to do. Um, but I did burn coal next to an ice cube, and that was my basic <laughs> premise of the experiment. Um, it was OK. It was an OK um, science fair project. The, the thing that I realized was that I did a ton of my research on global warming and climate change um, in, in uh, Chicago where my grandfather is, or was. And he was a mathematician, mm. super bright, one of my favorite, favorite people. Yeah. Uh, and our conversation was, I'm doing, a, what, you know, what, are you, what, what are you studying over there? Very excited. And I was like, I'm, I'm studying global warming. Huh. And my grandfather looked at me and said, there's no such thing. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. No, I know that there is, I'm studying it. I, have le I learned from my dad, I trust him. I, I know that there is. Every, every, all of my people seem to say that there are, and, but this really smart human in front of me is saying, there's no such thing. And my realization of, cl of the climate crisis was that there would be a debate and that we would put off action because people wouldn't be able to recognize the inherent sort of risk that was coming t towards us, but that we could be resilient in the face of that it wasn't yeah. It wasn't a severely debilitating concept. It was how do we how do we adapt and how do we think more creatively as as a population 
um, and, and think about doing better in the world and creating better spaces and creating flourishing communities rather than uh, avoiding the, the mm -hmm. uncomfortable case. And, and I think that that's, that's kind of when, I, when it triggered for me, and that was in fifth grade, so it's been a little while. Yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, some of that has been the case, but I think we're seeing more and more um, <laughs> with, with, with the real ingenuity that has been starting up, mm -hmm. you see s startups that are taking AI and machine learning and developing an understanding of the world that is faster and bigger than what we have been able to for the past five to 10 years. I mean, like it's been a massive evolution on the technology side to bring more of this information to the forefront and yeah. to really create a narrative that is real and tangible. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think somewhat, you know, making headlines as 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 a, you know much of a a trend thing as that might be. I think it's valuable in that it's introducing more uh, of the threat to us. It's also introducing us to um, more of the people around the world who are affected by it directly. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that when the people who have means are able to adapt more easily than they think about it. So for instance, people in San Francisco, we get uncomfortable <coughs> a little bit when we've got 80 degree days a couple of days in a row. I'm uh, loving it. <laughs> <laughs> says the girl from Miami. <laughs> um, but it, push came to shove, we, we would probably all, if we needed to go out and get window air conditioners or go out, we would just order from Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is exceedingly, <laughs> un, just incredibly unlikely around the world where people do not have the solution at their fingertips to be able to adapt to the things that are happening to their homes. Yeah. And, and I think that the more we see that, the more it's coming into play that we're actually able to, to take a commanding role and do something about this, yeah. and that the onus is on us to do that as well. So I, I think it's it, you know it's a it's a process, and, and I, I think that that's a little bit of when the climate crisis hit for me. But I think it's been an evolving view on it. Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay, I'm gonna add a couple of things. It's gonna. Oh, did you I have a quick question. Um, yeah. In terms of, so I'm from Houston, mm -hmm. and we've been hit hard. Uh, it's a pretty controversial, controversial issue, but what do you think about forced buyouts? In yeah. I mean, a lot of insurance companies are doing it, you right. know? I mean, if you're within that 100-year, 500-year, you know, floodplain, mm -hmm. you know, they're going in and they're buying your home because they just have to pay out too many claims. And they right. they, they deal in aggregate, you know, they, they're in actuarials. Like, they have, you know... IBM, you know, they've bought the Weather Channel because they want to make predictions about what the weather is going to do. And people buy that data quite uh, frequently to make those types of predictions. Um, and I think it's, 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 you know, if you can get something comparable, you know, to a community, you know, I think it's a great opportunity. But then also you have to be mindful of what the community is actually built on. You can't just move people. You know, you have to take the structures, the diversity, the culture, the people that make up that community, and then start to say, and work with them to say, okay, what do we want forward? And really make that narrative clear. Like, don't make it, you know, behind this steel door of capital, you know, like, oh, you know, let's try to go in and lowball them, you know, for a low price, because we know that, you know, there's gonna be more floods, you know, in these areas. How do we work with them and work with the community to start to understand how do we build more regenerative communities, maybe in a different location? So I'm, I'm for you, you know, with, with that, that type of, um, I, I agree that, you know, nobody should be in a position where they have to fear for their life, where they live, you know, through natural disasters. So that is one area, but I think it should be transparent as they're, as they're, doing, as they're doing that. And it should be made up of public-private partnerships. I mean, that's, that's something that I think has been missing where, where you do have insurance buyouts. I, I think there's a, there's an opportunity to shift, um, to, to think about a new and regenerative space that is enticing to people to move to, that shows a, a, a kind of a, an alluring aspect that is stronger than staying in a, a climate risk area. And thinking about how do you create those spaces? How do you partner with the private entities that have the money that need to stop people from buying homes that are completely at risk how do you work together to think about creating new 
new communities. And I think that there's a real opportunity there um, for, for many areas. And then these are all, like, you can do this in small ways and you can do it in large ways, but I'm thinking about, like, there are a lot of zoning issues that pop, that pop up when you start talking about some of this stuff, but there are very simple ways to get through those if you have some strong leadership at the local uh, government level. And I think, you know, it's just creating special special zoning cases, for example, and, and beginning to bring people to new areas and to, uh, just to introduce it. Um, and I think you can do that with public-private partnerships where you create really enticing other places to be. Start, start to develop some of the areas where you didn't think that they were developable. Um, start rehabbing some of those spaces that were where the soil hasn't been great. Um, and start thinking about trying to entice through tax incentives to get more businesses in those areas, sort of trying to draw out, thinking about it on a, at a planning scale. I mean, you really, that's, that's where you need the government somewhat involved, uh, and then it's helpful to have the money. And how, how do you guys think about that in the floodplains of Asia and Africa, where you have tens of thousands of slum homes uh, on the water or near the water? Uh, it strikes me that actually the very wealthy might be share something similar. Um, they want to be near the water, they, they share, the, they're proximate to the water, with the other end of the spectrum, who are the slum dwellers in Asian Africa that are thinking about Bangladesh or parts of India, where there's not strong governance, uh, where there is no financial backing to move them, no insurance to even think about this. Uh, how would you use that same lens in an environment like that? Any ideas? One one area is thinking about the, and you, you will know this even better than I will, but the, the civil infrastructure for bringing resources, and, and the, the, the money could be there with the right incentives on the, on the structural, the infrastructural side, um, to think about bringing the resources that are so incredibly valuable to the place where you want more of the congregation to be, um, and so thinking about leading leading the people to the water that is drinkable um, and trying to think about how you might craft a, an energy strategy or a water strategy around um, pulling pulling people towards those incredibly valuable resources. I, I, that's, not, uh, that's not a succinct answer because it doesn't really answer where the money comes from, but it's, it's a, more about figuring out the trigger incentives. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, you know, triggers and motivations is what moves us. Um, but also being able to go in and really map, you know, what it actually looks like. You know, you have to create a narrative. And I mean, as humans, we all believe in stories. And everything starts with a story, whether it's oratory or it's, you know, written down or it's seen on a movie screen. Um, but you have to understand what is actually happening on the ground, you know, where these agglomerations of, of informal living are. Um, and then what you can start to do is approach, okay, where can we actually start to move or use markets that are coming out of these informal communities like Nollywood, you know, or, you know, things of that nature that are creating mass amounts of money, you know, from the informal space that are being transferred over to almost the formal space or part of the GDP that can now start to move, you know, these communities in different areas that are well more informed uh, about where they live and how they live. But I, I want to really reiterate that the culture has to be there. Like those things have to stay intact or you just kind of get into another uh, colonization type of, uh, type of mentality. So, yeah. Yeah, it brings, it brings to mind, um, I think one of the, I don't have a succinct answer for that, but my thought is that you really need to empower the people that are there because there is, it's a lawlessness, but there is kind of a law. Sure. It's, it's the law of human beings, of creating tools as we need to, and it's human ingenuity. And so you touched on this thing of story, which I absolutely agree and love. Um, and I want to pair that with um, the new tools that we have. So uh, a friend of mine from Magic Leap um, just shared this article with me recently, and it was about how Magic Leap could potentially kind of create a uh, a projection of uh, if you make a decision today how it will impact and you can kind of see it and seeing it kind of informs you in a new way it creates this new ability to um, future cast any in unintended consequences which I think we've been talking about um, kind of underlyingly is, is we're kind of at a point where we need to really start thinking about externalities and unintended consequences of our decisions because we don't have a lot of time um, and we need to get more and more people on board and understanding that they have a voice. Um, one, one example of this is 
um, how the youth is uh, suing governments, they're engaging law, and they're suing them because because the, our generation and, and those after um, are going to be affected by the decisions and the inaction that's happening today. And so to have this idea, because it's, it, it must have started as an idea, sure. and then to have the audacity to mm -hmm. then sue the states, sue, sue, sue the governments, um, to uh, to actually get action and reaction from them, I think is one really clear example of how maybe informal slum dwellers can start um, changing behavior, that it's not disempowered, but actually use what you have um, already in the system. Cool. So I'm gonna move on to the next, um, this is uh, a quote, oh. Um, so something that I was really hoping to not be sick for <laughs> um, and to kind of share with you is, if there's one thing that I would love for us to take away is that um, we're no longer kind of living in sustainability. We can't sustain our consumption. We can't sustain these things. We need to start moving towards a regenerative um, uh, design, regenerative and circular economy and that sort of thing. Um, and I think it's starting to be picked up now. So um, there is two more quotes and you guys are gonna go back to back. Um, C40, Climate Leaders Group. You can read it slow and loud. Thanks. Okay. Cities are the global centers of communication, commerce, and culture. What our cities do individually and in unison can set the agenda for a sustainable future. Cities consume over two-thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of global carbon dioxide emissions. And with 90% of the world's urban areas situated on coastlines, cities are at high risk from some of the devastating and the second one is from the World Future Council. A new type of urban development powered by renewable energy, driven by a circular economy, and defined by a restorative and mutually beneficial relationship between cities and their hinterland is urgently needed. Cities must go beyond sustainability to become truly regenerative not only being resource efficient and low carbon, but positively enhancing rather than undermining the ecosystems on which they depend. Regenerative cities mimic nature's circular metabolism by operating in a closed loop system that transforms waste outputs into inputs of value. This will mean creating cities that not only deplete resources and damage ecosystems, but that actively contribute to the regeneration of the natural resources they consume and the ecosystem services they rely on. And so the next two questions are for both Marcus and Julia, but also for, for all of you, if you have ideas. Um, first is, how might emergent cities uh, become a regenerative uh, city? And what do circular cities look and feel like? Easy questions. <laughs> I think when we think of future um, regenerative cities, uh, this goes back to a little bit of what, uh, and it's actually mentioned in that quote a little bit as well, the, the idea of urban metabolism and thinking about the byproducts of systems being the fuel in which they run, right? And I, I, that's generally what that quote was getting at. Um, what ways that we will, I think, be able to think about that um, will be about uh, again, a transparency through both our, each other and technology. I think um, the ability to to see and and hear one another, I think, is actually I think crucial. I think this idea of building on a cultural and community resource is incredibly valuable for thinking about us as a regenerative society. Um, and I think that that cities in in knowing each other and then having visibility on what's needed and that needs assessment, going back to our fundamental needs, um, we'll be able to think about how we uh, how we utilize what would have been waste and, and, and waste in terms of when we cool, we, we produce heat. That's something that always happens. How are we using that heat back into our systems to fuel the, the kinetic energy needed to move, to, to move up a level, for example. Um, I think we may have um, 
we may have systems of automation that are super dynamic based on exactly what we need, but we also may have downtimes. So there may be a pause a little bit in how we are moving about the city um, in order to think about um, power being available as, as you need it, mm. and then it shifts to its new source where it's donating, it's, it's you know, recovered somewhere else. Mm. Um, so I, I could see that being, um, to say that the, the actual pace of life being slower sounds like you're moving to Tahiti or something, and that's not what I mean. Um, but that, that, that we're actually more involved with our systems, that we are actively part of, we, we've consumed this, how will that get redistributed to yeah. my neighbor? And, and I care about my neighbor because I know my neighbor. Um, and, and I think that, that we'll start to see regenerative cities as looking a little bit more, um, we, we might say pedestrian, but, but also just um, dynamic in a way that we can feel. Mm. And, and I, would, I would think about that as, as one of those concepts. But I, I'm going to turn this over to Marcus. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's just also about framing as well, like understanding how much energy that we as humans can actually con consume um, or even output, you know, as a human biological system, like our muscles will allow us to create about 100 watts of, of power, you know, but our throughput every day is about 6,000 watts. You know, so the conversion rate, you know, of using fossil fuels, uh, diesel tur turbines, you know, is is, is, is w too slanted to talk about regeneration without understanding what our actual human input is and what the output um, you know, should be. Um, and I think it also gets into material science. Like we really have to start investing into material science and what our built environments are made out of. Um, you know, we have a lot of breakthroughs in nanotechnology that allow us to reuse, break down, um, and create this circular type of economy, whether it be through wearables or whether it be through products, uh, consumer goods, you know, all these things. Um, and I'm just going to punch it, you know, in the face, get rid of microplastics, period. You know, like those things are not needed for in order to actually move our society forward. So really kind of looking at what materials, um, you know, can be utilized uh, in this regenerative type of cycle, uh, understanding what our input and our throughput is, um, and really moving away from that fossil fuels uh, type of habitual uh, treatment, I think is something that we can approach uh, with some, some behavior change. Yeah. Do others have ideas? Can I have some questions? When thinking about the circular city, how do you guys view that image in the continent? So I think circular, circular <coughs> as, as the way that I mean it, is, yeah. is always accounting for the externality and turning something that is, is, supposed, is supposedly waste into something that is um, of value. So a great example is um, a, a famous uh, burger joint that is not to be named um, creates a lot of burgers, but they also, their externality is a lot of grease. Um, and then that grease can actually be tossed out and into a landfill or into a pipe causing lots of hazard, or it could be turned into fuel, right? And I think with the, the, rural, um, the rural connection to the, uh, to the city, I don't have an answer for that, but I, what I wanted to say with the, with the rule is that I see often that there is a recycling and a reusing of a lot of, a lot of the materials there. So maybe there isn't, doesn't need to be kind of like a full-fledged thought of how um, we integrate rural and cities, but um, but the materials used in, in farming and that sort of thing um, are re very resource conscious and, and get reused. Yeah, I think, I think in part it's about thinking about the scale of where, of where regenerative happens and how that circularity is completed. And so uh, on what, just on what scale? Can you do it within a household? And then can you expand it to the business next to you? And, then, and, and I think thinking about it in that way doesn't, in, doesn't it, um, oblige a rural community to become a circular city, but rather to think about circularity in everything that it does. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the general store is benefiting from the farmland that's closer to it. And this gets to the new development around 
culinary procurement where the di direct is a new option that is something that more and more farmers are kind of playing into uh, and thinking about uh, making more visible to the people who are finally consuming their product, that the more people it hits on the way, the more loss of value there is along mm. the way, both of the food quality itself plus on the financial right. side. So what if we bring that closer to home and how does it benefit the full system, uh, let alone the transportation demands and, and, and inefficiencies? So I, I think that there's, I think we, we have to continue to think about it, it at scale and certainly on the farming side, there's such a natural balance with, with farming and um, circularity when we think about rural areas, we often think about farming, but there are a lot of other communities yeah. that benefit from a similar concept, but I think it has to be taken to the scale at which it's trying to operate. There's also, um, it just came to mind, so when when cities uh, which have a lot of grocery stores and food stores, there's a lot of food waste, and that waste could then become compost that is then, you know, set, and that, that kind of communication can be had. Yeah. Or, or just another aspect that, you know, PZO, I mean, we all walk somewhere. You know, every day we're transporting, we're moving our bodies, we're moving big machines, we're doing these things. You know, how about capturing, you know, that effort and that kinetic energy, you know, to re actually invest it into, you know, your organism or your community, you know, instead of just letting it go into the ether, you know, really trying to, um, you know, get that into a circular uh, type of economy. Can you give me an example? What do you mean? So PZO is, is basically if I'm going to walk, say there's materials that can actually be uh, generate that can generate some type of kinetic energy yeah. that transforms into wattage or, or things of that nature. Interesting. Yeah. So. So thoughts on this? I think first, why don't struggle with the fact that capitalism keeps driving us towards inefficiency and less sustainability? But it also the more I read about pro-capitalist readings and media and articles. It has been the most um, efficient way of resource allocation. It's the system that, regardless of what country we come from, we adopt. That's what unites us. Um, but I feel like we look to technology for answers because I think there's a tendency to give up the least we can for the most benefit. We don't want to give up our standard of living. We, we want to innovate at, at our current standard of living and try to solve the global problem while still being living the life that we live. But I think a lot of it, so mm. I believe that the change has to come through policy and it requires the courage of Greta Thunberg and children suing governments because policy requires courage and policy is what's going to shift the metrics that guide the economy. So the answer is probably capitalism because it has worked for the last thousand years, but different metrics for capitalism. There is no, no such thing as perpetual GDP growth. Mm -hmm. So when we keep talking about recessions and fear them, when we the fear of recession and the fear of declining growth is so ingrained in us that it's misaligned with even trying to dream about a regenerative or circular economy. Interesting. describing this as the GoFundMe of the <laughs> community energy. It's fantastic. It's yeah. a really good program. Yeah. And it's a great case of, of urban activism. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Derek, did you have something? Yeah, I think that's just a good case of uh, like a fundamental human problem or social problem there is, is just coordination problems. <laughs> things are like things just apply to, to yeah. the infrastructure and facilities would be a good idea. I, I wanted to quickly build on, on Agnes point that Going back to just what do we imagine a regenerative city to look like? Mm. I actually I put a lot of kind of trust in, and maybe I won't specifically say capitalism, but just free market forces. Yeah. And I think one 
problem with how we debate that issue is that like we can't just look at the world around us and assume that's a free market and then have thoughts on, on that. There's so many rigged and regulatory captured elements of, of what's going on right now. But, but, but I agree that there's something fundamental about a free market that will be able to tackle this resource allocation problem um, efficiently if it is directed in the right way. So I think then the policy question is price on carbon and, and, and how to price negative externalities in a general sense of, uh, of, of waste streams. Then I think if, if that's the focus, and that might have to come through political action and so forth, uh, I think we can fairly rest assured that like all the market forces that, that are around us will jump into action to, to make that work. And that can look different in a developing and developed world context. Um, but I think we should just not feel hopeless that, that we don't have like what I think is a key tool already to work with, but we just haven't figured out how to put the policy environment in which a free market can actually work. Sure. And then just to piggyback on that, you know, I think we're changing our mentality. And I even think that the youth are changing their mentality around access and ownership. You know, the capital markets, they want you to own things and accumulate things. But the youth, they just want access. You know, they want to be able to go out and, you know, to communicate and to commune with their friends and play and do what they want to do, create when they want to create. And they'll pay some nominal thing for that, so the capital markets will be adhered to. But at the same time, the ownership of a material or, you know, something of that nature, you know, I think that is slowly starting to transition out of that capital market framework. That's why I didn't want to bring capital into it, because I feel like it's, it's like that ownership piece is something maybe we really consider. Sure. And I think, I think it's happening. I, I, it's fits and spurts, and, and it's certainly more existent in other parts of the world. Um, so it's important to not be too American-centric about this. But the way I've described this in the past is the concept of, um, of a refrigerator. I don't care about the refrigerator. I definitely care about the cooling as a service that it brings me. And the idea that, that, that we could tap into services rather than things and think about more about how we all share similar services and that there are things that bring us those, but that those can be upcycled and recycled more easily if we don't feel committed to putting them into the waste stream. That I, the idea that I'd have to deal with, or even the company that sold it to me, I have to deal with wasting it then. That there's no built out system for trading it up and down based on what someone else is interested in for which model they might need or want. Um, that's something that I think could really permeate this to extend the life of things and to think about the life cycle of those things. And I think that we're, we're getting more into that ability to think that way because we want to, because I think we're thinking more about experience over things in general. And, and I think that that is a really positive and fruitful concept of the future of our society. Um, so I think the idea that we can be hopeful, and that's, this is, goes back to an Al Gore sentiment about the, the, the thing that will drive us to create the solutions that we need is simply is hope. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to drive a narrative around this that is driven by um, thinking about solutions and thinking about that world that we want to create, not only the fear of, of um, not having enough help, not having enough technology, not having enough tools, um, but, but faith in the resilience of people and faith in the idea that we can educate ourselves to move in the, in the right and positive direction. What's your name, sorry? My name is Yeshua, and I'm going to throw a disruptive idea. Please. In the room. Perfect. Um, and so I operate, just full transparency, quite a bit in the field of regenerative development. Okay. So many of my mentors I work with closely, like Donna Permaculture, Living Systems Design, Biomimicry, um, and LEED certification. And some of those, like LEED, that has been found is that as those were established, this best practice has turned out to fail in many ways. So now we have you know, living buildings, and that itself is gonna be reinvented. And I give that as an example, as in there's a major hazard we have to fall into the place that sustainability, or regeneration is actually just sustainability with a cloak of a new word. And um, regenerate team with ING <clears throat> changes the frame of the mind of how we relate to what we're working with. And then we ask, what are we regenerating? Um, are we regenerating our best practices? Everything that we know today as best practices will be outdated tomorrow or soon enough. And so how do we hold that in mind that we don't have the solutions actually that's needed for 2050? And that's really important, I think, to set um, what we're doing, um, something like a living building. I've worked with some of the largest living buildings today on projects, 
And it's, it's been scary to me because I thought that was an aspiration. We'll get there, it's done, and then realize it's a complete disconnect to community, our humanity with each other, what is the potential of what we're actually trying to create, evolving and the, the evolution of the organizations that are part of it. Um, I mean, the, the full entity as a whole, there's so much potential of what cities, what organizations, what people coming together can be. And as long as we hold best practices in front of us, um, we'll be disillusioned of the potential of what we can become. So that, that's my invitation is how is it we're continuously regenerating ourselves and our ideas of what we think these solutions are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thank you Thank for you. that. Hi, um, I'd like to kind of add to that because we're off of that. Um, we've, <clears throat> sorry, we've talked a little bit about or touched on, you know, kind of self-organizing, um, re resource allocation, uh, how capital markets kind of have enabled that to some degree, um, and also very much the necessity to to what does the original question what do you mean with cities and then what does that look like, um, you know, in uh, rural areas as well, and. <clears throat> I'd like to ask, like, when just tagging on to this, this last piece, that is kind of like a moving target. The more you, you add to it, the more the thing itself mm. changes. And it is kind of like a moving target. And I'd like to ask you guys and everybody in the room, what kinds of, like, is it like, the first thing that comes to mind to me, is it a modular design that, like, shifts and moves on its own and has that, or, like, when it comes to an, an urban setting or an urban planning kind of um, headset, or I don't know what minds are in the room, how it plans to you, how do you create an, or an organism, a system, maybe a city, that is responsive to a moving target? Hmm. Like what comes to mind? So for me, it gets back to material science, um, and then also adding on top of that layer, you know, generative design. You know, looking at how do we, how do we, you know, take all of the thousands of years of architecture and start to combine that with knowing what type of materials may work in a certain area. You know, the same building that works in Legos may not work in Shanghai, you know, and it, it's, it's like going to those best practices. One best practice is just make one little tweak to the geography or to the culture within that, in that community, then, you know, it has detrimental effects to that community. So looking at generative designs that can actually almost be made as dumb cities. We talk about smart cities, but it's about dumb platforms that can be moved and shifted depending on what the current landscape actually looks like. So not making these kind of heavy, you know, robust systems, but things that can actually move and be a little bit more generative in their, in their makeup. Yeah, just to add, uh, dive on you, um, I saw a cool video or article about how the Kumbh Mela, which I always knew was a festival, a religious festival in India, always heard about it. Um, someone, an architect pitched that as a transient city. So it's a city of two million people that comes together to celebrate this festival. And all of the, the built environment for that comes together by bringing in stick-built uh, shelters from the villages around. They create clinics, hospitals, check-in counters, everything that you need to support two million people, which is twice San Francisco and then it gets distributed back to the villages at the end of the festival. Mm -hmm. So the resilience that you get from having an adapt adaptable city that's lean like that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so when we're talking about a circular, regenerative city, the first thing that comes to my mind is more plants and animals. And you know, one simple way in a city, imagine a bee looks you know, to find a flower with nectar in the city with millions of neon lights. And why don't we spray the neon lights with sugar? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would push back just a little bit on that. You know, that I, I, I don't believe that innovation is just a... Technologically. Or even technologically. You know, there's a gentleman, like a small boy in Sierra Leone that built a helicopter, you know, out of secondhand uh, materials. 
you know, so I mean, there are, and, and me even just, you know, being on the ground in a lot of these different communities, like innovation is there. Um, you know, I'll, I'll reference uh, the, you know, Syrian uh, refugee camp there. You know, when I went there, within 16 months, you know, they had a bike shop, they had a, they had a bread shop. Even when I was leaving the first time, they were building a fine arts gallery, you know, within the community. So the innovation is there, you know, and the sustainability is there. You know, the regeneration is there. The smarts is there. The intellect is there. It's just what we value as humanity may not be as permeant as, say, you know, looking at a first world country because we have insulation. We have these bricks and, and, and materials that we can actually tangibly touch. Um, but that doesn't negate that, you know, people are living their lives, you know, in a very healthy, happy manner, even in some of the most desolate areas of that. So it's just about kind of utilizing and maximizing, whether it be in a city or in an informal living space, of what that means to that community, you know. Another so. way of res responding to that without coming up with a solution for the price point to share interesting and innovative technology, which is a serious question and I don't have a good answer for. Um, would be to also just to be thinking about the mindset that creates sustainable materials, which is inherently thinking about their life cycle instead of about their development. So when, when we think about what that, how that material is created and not wasted, what is its next life? Not when do we throw it out next and how many more of these do we need? Um, I, I actually think that there's an evolution of this material science that goes into the communities that are being resilient and creating materials themselves. So I, I just I would push back and only just to say that I'm not sure the same material, the exact technology is needed in all of the same places at all of the same time. Um, but I do think the right philosophy and the thoughtfulness around life cycle of, of materials in, and in many of these places, it actually exists better than it does in cities. Uh, to think about that life cycle is something that, that that actually can be spread very quickly. And I, I think that that's something that we should be thinking about, about education models that are provoking us to think about upcycling materials um, and, and thinking about how we can share more ed, ed, sim, you know, workshops, uh, incubators, things that are um, creating really great solutions around the world that we may just not need exactly the same technology at all the same time in all the places. Um, that doesn't solve what you're asking, but it, it's, it's just another way of thinking about it. I think uh, an underlying thing that you may be asking is um, how do we connect kind of informal cities um, with the formal cities that's either local or kind of far away? Now that we have the internet, we're connected in, in ways that are really profound. And the internet, uh, let me remind everyone, is not everywhere yet. Um, but even still, there's a, an ability to kind of reach out across the world and find out via YouTube or via any other uh, mode, oh, there's this thing, let me play with that in, in, in my context. What does that look like? How do I, and, it, and to your point, Yeshua, yes. um, was you know, really contextualizing it to where that innovation is. And we, you know, the informal cities may not have the marketing of in innovation and, and innovation industry, but they certainly have innovation, we all do. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one last question, which is the equity question, and then we can wrap up. How does that feel? Okay, so the last question is, and we kind of already know this, but what is the role of equity in emergent cities? All right. <laughs> um, I think it's, I mean, there's, there's no other way to put it than vitally important, but I think the, the role that um, diversity and community play in developing equity is, is uh, these are all linked. So I think the more, um, the more that we think about building community, the, the more we think about introducing ourselves to others and, and playing the role that says that our, our ability to help is as good as our exposure, um, to really think about opening ourselves up to hearing and seeing the story, stories and people from around the world uh, and, and thinking through the lifestyles that others have and exposing ourselves to those thoughts I think is what triggers us to have empathy and build community with people around the world who are different than we are. And I think that that is fundamental to the idea of building equity. So while it's, 
it's sort of easy to say like well developed nations have a much larger part in climate change and should be doing a much larger part about it i think we already know that but i think one thing that will stem us and connect us to why we would do that which is the more important part is the, is the why is is knowing and and you can see it across um sort of recent history you can see it from the lgbtqt movement um where the many many studies showed that it, as as soon as there was more exposure to someone who was living a slightly different I idea of, of identity than you were, that that all of a sudden caught like, like wildfire. Yeah. And so I think in exposing ourselves to more of that community, we have the ability and leverage points to build more of that equity. I think it is vitally important and it needs to be front and foremost, mm. not a, oh, well, by, by doing a thing that we would do otherwise, we'll build equity, that would be nice. Yeah. It, it actually has to be the motivating factor. Right. Um, but I think we have to see that as driving um, diverse thought and, and resiliency in ourselves. I, I think it doesn't only have to be altruistic, although you can make a great argument for being altruistic as well. Um, but I think ultimately it builds ourselves and it builds our communities by building up the communities we haven't met yet. So I think that that's my tag into equity. Yeah, and for me, you know, I think it's really about defining what equity means, you know. Uh, for me, you know, I wouldn't want everybody to be necessarily equal. You know, I think there's an appreciation, you know, for everybody and what they bring to the community that should be adhered to at all times. Um, and I think that should hold value, intrinsic value within itself as well as to, to the community. Um, and I think through that appreciation, you start to look at the diversity within the community, as Julia mentioned, that uh, we all have something to bring to the table. We all have some importance. Um, and I think, you know, with that different type of framework, we can start looking at the feminine, you know, energy as well as the masculine energy as not a competing thing, but that there's a time and a place for both. You know, that it's not just about, um, you know, leveling up on um, us being equal or me being equal to someone else, but it's just really about uh, how do we frame what is important to all of us? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we actually come to common values and common goals and common understanding about where we want to go together? Um, and I think through that, we can start to make really good headway on, you know, what future do we want to build? Um, and not only that, but how do we actually look at the ancient? You know, how do we go back and look at how these communities that have survived for thousands and thousands of years and what did they do right? You know, not necessarily where do we want to take them, but what did they do right that we should preserve um, that will actually lead us into a, a new world? Okay, with that, I'm going to invite us all to kind of stand. Because we've been sitting a while. <laughs> take a couple breaths and in a minute I'm going to ask whoever wants to share kind of some of the takeaways that they heard in popcorn style. Sorry, what is popcorn style? Ah, popcorn style. <laughs> popcorn style is at will. Oh. Spontaneous. Came away with um, an even deeper understanding that we really need to start um, 
thinking about climate migration as an unintended consequence of our denial and our um, lack of narrative, collective narrative around it. And so kind of looking at communities that are at risk, there's a lot of opportunity there um, to empower that community um, to move somewhere different and do something different. I'm more aware of my ignorance that <laughs> it's not that long. 88 million people in the city is like unfathomable. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm sitting with that more. I think there's, there's a lot <laughs> to sit with. Uh, two thoughts. Uh, one, I really like the idea of feedback systems. I thought about what a transparent trash, trash can would motivate us to do when we saw the amount of waste filling up in it. And the second, the humbling idea first to realize the diversity of ideas that come out of a crowd like this, mm -hmm. but then to realize that it needs to be the generations after us that have to continue to think like this uh, on a global scale, and so the power of education and the need to have way more proactive uh, education being constantly evolving as well. Why have curriculums that are set in stone over 20 years? We will never catch up if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Two questions I'm thinking about. Um, one is how do we kind of design for adaptability? That's sort of a you know, familiar challenge for us. Um, and then the question around migration, like how how do we, if we assume migration is going to happen, how can that happen in a way where people are empowered and where can we kind of maintain culture and community in a way that's less disruptive? Um, and then there's something that you said, it's like two questions previously where I almost wrote it down, I was like, I want to remember that, and then I forgot. <laughs> where he was telling me what he learned uh, about making smart homes was the transparency of, of seeing kind of like what the impact is that you're making. And so bringing that more and more into the conversation. And at my house, there's a sign on their garbage can that says this goes in a hole in the ground, just as a low-tech version of <laughs> <laughs> should this be there? <laughs> okay, with that, I'm just going to close out the circle. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining this little experiment um, and for participating with either, either ears or thoughts um, yourself. 
There is a sign-up sheet for a workshop, which will be much more action-oriented and much more um, objective-driven. Um, so that sign-up is where, Jonathan? Uh, I think it's on the table, the white table over there. Yeah. White table over there. Um, and yes, thank you so much.